Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President Agnew speaks out on the problems and issues confronting America today. What is the greatest issue today? It's not the war in Vietnam. It's not inflation, nor the environment. It's not an issue that you even hear discussed in its stark and simple enormity. But it is nonetheless the overriding and compelling issue in the United States today. Simply stated, it is, will the government of this country remain in the hands of its elected officials, or will it descend to the streets? It is not unusual, nor should it be distressing, that individuals of monumental ego among the failures of our society should attack everything fundamental to our free culture. They're simply lashing out in all directions because they cannot bear to face their individual inadequacies. Neither should it overly concern us that certain brilliant but sequestered academicians are criticizing the government. This has always been so and probably always will be so. Sometimes it even does some good. The vice president focuses on the irresponsible attacks from a small segment of our society. But I want you to know that I will not make a unilateral withdrawal and thereby abridge the confidence of the silent majority. The everyday law-abiding American who believes in his country needs a strong voice to articulate his dissatisfaction with those who seek to destroy our heritage of liberty and our system of justice. To penetrate the cacophony of seditious drivel emanating from the best publicized clowns in our society and their fans in the fourth estate. Yes, my friends, to penetrate that drivel, we need a cry of alarm, not a whisper. In answer to the attacks of these dissenters, the vice president states, And if the hippies and the yippies and the disruptors of the systems that Washington and Lincoln as presidents brought forth in this country will shut up and work within our free system of government, I will lower my voice. And if the Black Panther Party will disclaim its publicized purpose of violence and overthrow of our elected government by force and will run candidates for election in the traditional democratic fashion, I will lower my voice. And if the SDS and the RAM and the PLP will transfer their allegiance from Mao Zedong and Castro and the Viet Cong to the United States of America, I will subside to a more professorial tone. The vice president has the following comments on the bizarre times in which we live. Sometimes it appears that we're reaching a period when our senses and our minds will no longer respond to moderate stimulation. We seem to be approaching an age of the gross. Persuasion through speeches and books is too often discarded for disruptive demonstrations aimed at bludgeoning the unconvinced into action. The young, and by this, I don't mean by any stretch of the imagination all the young, but I'm talking about those who claim to speak for the young. At the zenith of physical power and sensitivity, overwhelm themselves with drugs and artificial stimulants. Subtlety is lost, and fine distinctions based on acute reasoning are carelessly ignored in a headlong jump to a predetermined conclusion. Life is visceral rather than intellectual. And the most visceral practitioners of life are those who characterize themselves as intellectuals. Truth is 
to them revealed rather than logically proved. And the principal infatuations of today revolve around the social sciences, those subjects which can accommodate any opinion and about which the most reckless conjecture cannot be discredited. Education is being redefined at the demand of the uneducated to suit the ideas of the uneducated. The student now goes to college to proclaim rather than to learn. The lessons of the past are ignored and obliterated in a contemporary antagonism known as the generation gap. A spirit of national masochism prevails, encouraged by an effete core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves as intellectuals. Why then, if these political phenomena are standard to a democratic government, should we be disturbed about them today? The answer lies not in the fear of kooks or demagogues themselves, but in their current respectability. Never in our history have we paid so much attention to so many odd characters. Twenty-five years ago, the tragicomic antics of such societal misfits would have brought the establishment running after them with butterfly nets rather than television cameras. It's in this inordinate attention to the bizarre, this preoccupation with the dramatic, this rationalization of the ridiculous that we threaten the progress of our nation. I believe that physical confrontation cannot be a productive substitute for debate. I believe that men of goodwill and intent must sit down with each other to solve problems, not to act in the theater of public opinion. In defense of the courts of the land, the vice president has the following to say. Gentlemen, I propose that all of us elected to positions of governmental responsibility should speak out forcefully and directly against the outrageous patterns of conduct which have become so fashionable of late. Whether or not one agrees with every ruling that the judge made in the recent Chicago trial is not the point. The point is that a handful of oddballs deliberately set out to politicize a simple criminal proceeding and to disrupt the most basic protection of our society, the dignity of the courts. The point is that the new technique of judicial disruption is spreading like wildfire throughout the country. The tactic is to provoke and inflame in the hope that overreaction will obliterate the true nature of the proceeding. The Democratic Party has not been neglected by Vice President Agnew. To hear the party that piled up $58 billion of deficits and created the worst inflation this country ever had complain about the purchasing power of the dollar just tugged at my heartstrings. <laughs> to hear the publishers of the Great Society and the New Frontier complain about spending was like hearing germs complain about disease. <laughs> to listen to the party that sent over a half million men to Vietnam decry the rate of our disengagement is a bit like lighting a fire and then criticizing the firemen. <laughs> Let's not forget, my friends, that it was the policies of these same Democrats that sparked the wave of lawlessness and permissiveness that brought the United States to the verge of civil disorder. We've had eight years of their non-leadership, and we now have a leader of courage and vision in the White House. And already they're carping that the mess hasn't been cleaned up. Well, it's pretty hard to clean a floor when a bunch of muddy-footed opposition congressmen keep tracking through the kitchen looking for the cookie jar. <laughs> that 
that's one of the differences that's always struck me between the Democratic and the Republican parties. The Democrats are always trying to spend their way out of America's imagined difficulties, while the Republicans are always trying to find ways to pay bills run up by the Democrats. But it seems like every time we get the bills paid, they come in on another set of freewheeling, fancy promises and run up a new set of debts. And finally, in answer to America's detractors, our answer today is the same as the answer in the days of Washington and Lincoln. Let the forces of logic and reason continue to shine strongly. Let the people who made the United States a great nation continue to bequeath it to those who will make it greater. And let the few the very few who would desecrate their own house be made fully aware of our utter contempt. The vice president's reputation for wit is well deserved, often at his own expense. I enjoyed my recent visits to our Asian embassies. Eight of them still had windows. <laughs> I knew I did... Uh, fairly well when Bob Hope told me that he thought it was a little much that I waited ashore at Manila. <laughs> and I remember uh, an experience President Nixon had with his schedule. He picked it up one day and it had this scenario. It said, President Nixon will speak for 10 minutes, following which his remarks will be translated into English. <laughs> well, I knew we had a trouble uh, communicating sometimes. I didn't think it was that bad. But I think the funniest thing that happened to me over there was the intensity of the coverage. We were going, Judy and I were going through a, a temple in Bangkok. And you, of course, you had to remove your shoes. And as we came out, I went to put my shoes on, and one of the photographers followed me right down to the chair and then down onto the floor with his camera about that far off the floor. And he was focusing on my foot as I was putting my shoe on. Well, I could understand that had certain human interest. But then a radio reporter rushed down to me with a microphone and he got down the floor and he kept holding the microphone up to my foot <laughs> I guess he thought that instead of putting my foot in my mouth I might have my mouth in my foot I don't know. This, uh... And of course, sometimes it is turned on others. Lyndon Johnson, who was elected to a high office. At least I think he was elected to a high office. If I read a few more memoirs of Kennedy AIDS, I may find that he never existed at all. <laughs> Our Asian policy is explained by Vice President Agnew. And I found approbation and understanding of the new Nixon doctrine, a doctrine that says, yes, the United States is a Pacific power. The United States will continue to be involved in the welfare of Asia. The United States will provide a nuclear screen to protect these countries against nuclear attack by a superpower. But the United States will not be a father the United States will be a partner to stimulate regional cooperation and economic growth. And as I went around to the various Asian nations, I found a, a fear that some limited defeat on a South Vietnamese outfit would have the effect of beginning a new wave of anti-war furor in the United States. We want to get out honorably and quickly and the people of this country have shown that they are behind the president in this. And in answer to its critics, the vice president says, When I see a United States senator travel to Paris and engage in secret conversations with the enemy, 
at a time when he should be reinforcing the solidarity of our effort to bring an end to that conflagration. It makes me wonder what the people in that state were thinking of when they sent that man to the Senate. Senator Fulbright said some months ago that if the Vietnam War went on much longer, the best of our young people would be in Canada. Well, I'd just as soon let Senator Fulbright go prospecting for his future party leaders in the deserters' dens of Canada and Sweden. We Republicans will look elsewhere. Indeed, as for these deserters, malcontents, radicals, incendiaries, the civil and the uncivil disobedience among our young, SDS, PLP, Weatherman 1, Weatherman 2, the Revolutionary Action Movement, Panthers, Lions, Hippies, Yippies, Tigers alike, I'd rather swap the whole damn zoo for a single platoon of the kind of young Americans I saw in Vietnam. The Vice President offers these observations on the administration and the future of the Republican Party. The administration has moved from the defensive to the offensive. We are not going to sit back and wait for this earth to be destroyed or go out with band-aids to patch gaping wounds. We are going to plan and prevent. We are going to stop problems before they start. But in spite of intelligent executive initiative, in spite of some gains, in the end, we come to one basic truth. A president can propose, but only Congress can dispose. A Congress bent on political rationalization of its acts, a Congress dedicated to creating failures for its president, is not a Congress for these difficult and perilous times. Your president deserves a Republican Congress with leadership dedicated to the success, not to the failure, of his administration. Yes, and we want the young voters who want to do something more than talk about what's wrong with the system. We want those who want to change things from within, and we say to them, come along with us. We want those Democrats, of whom I spoke earlier, who've been dispossessed by their national leadership. We want those who believe that the principles which unite us as citizens are greater than the economic, ethnic, or regional interests which divide us as individuals. In 1970, we have a message to get across to the people of this country. The Republican Party is ready, willing, and able to provide leadership. It is more interested in people's principles than their politics. Forget past labels and look at our logic. We are not the party which tears America down. We are the party which wants to build America up. I look upon the youth of today of every place and creed as a fountainhead of ideas, as an infinite reservoir of knowledge containing energy of solar dimensions. All of our hopes for the future are with them. We need them in the Republican Party. I would hope that the wayward few will cast off the blanket of filth and confusion, the dependency on drugs and artificial stimulants, that they will shed their negative thesis and return to the pursuit and in time, yes, to the realization of the American ideal. The Vice President points out an area of power and of the responsibility that should go with that power. The purpose of my remarks tonight is to focus your attention on this little group of men who not only enjoy a right of instant rebuttal to every presidential address, but more importantly, wield a free hand in selecting, presenting, and interpreting the great issues in our nation. 
Monday night, a week ago, President Nixon delivered the most important address of his administration, one of the most important of our decade. His subject was Vietnam. My hope, as his, at that time, was to rally the American people to see the conflict through to a lasting and just peace in the Pacific. For 32 minutes, he reasoned with a nation that has suffered almost a third of a million casualties in the longest war in its history. When the president completed his address, an address, incidentally, that he spent weeks in the preparation of, his words and policies were subjected to instant analysis and querulous criticism. The audience of 70 million Americans gathered to hear the President of the United States was inherited by a small band of network commentators and self-appointed analysts, the majority of whom expressed in one way or another their hostility to what he had to say. Now, every American has a right to disagree with the President of the United States and to express publicly that disagreement. But the President of the United States has a right to communicate directly with the people who elected him. And the, <laughs> and the people of this country have the right to make up their own minds and form their own opinions about a presidential address without having the president's words and thoughts characterized through the prejudices of hostile critics before they can even be digested. To those who show a lack of faith in America's principles, the vice president has these closing comments. I believe that this matter of approach on the part of educators is one of more importance than ever in these times when there's such an extreme concentration on the negative. We're constantly bombarded with strident cries of what's wrong with America. And this has led too many people to believe that this great country is in the grip of anarchy, panic, repression, or despair. Now, fortunately, you know and I know that this just isn't so. And let every American be assured that it's not going to be so. This should and will continue to be a society of great expectations. As we go forward into the 70s, we must and we will see more of these expectations become realities. We will preserve and we will enlarge the American dream. We will nourish and we will refresh the American spirit. We will enhance the quality of life for all Americans. And we will prove once again that in America, the voices of despair are ultimately stilled by the clear fact of progress. In closing, let me say simply that I'm growing terribly weary of America's noisy detractors. This is such a terrible place to live. If our government is so oppressive and inept, then why is there an endless waiting list of people seeking to emigrate to America? <laughs> why doesn't the so-called brain drain of Europe's brightest scientists and technicians moving to the U.S. to work run in the opposite direction. Today, we, the people of America, should vow to emphasize what is right, what is decent, and what is good about our great country.